Okay, you just type www.amazon.com. That takes you to our website. The British do more of their shopping online than any other nation. Last year, tens of millions of British customers used Amazon to buy four and a half billion pounds worth of goods. It's the instant gratification part of it that is so attractive to me and a little bit ominous. Amazon is accused of changing the book business from this... Just want to read through a couple of pages to see what you think. ...to this. Amazon's ambitions now stretch way beyond books. We're about to leave for Afghanistan. ...into the world of media. Introducing Amazon Fire TV. Its drive to cut prices puts the squeeze on competitors. This is actually designed from the ground up to be a shark. Like, it's designed to dissolve and destroy other businesses. But Amazon is also creating new jobs in Britain. It gives us an opportunity to access a marketplace that we would never otherwise be able to access. Start with the customer and work backwards. Amazon's amazing story, from startup to global titan, is also the story of its founder, Jeff Bezos. He really is a tough boss. He has driven that company and drives those people very, very hard. We ask what Amazon's ever-growing business is doing to our economy and our lives. And we examine how Jeff Bezos's formula for success shapes Amazon's culture and has made him such a happy billionaire. <laughs> many places where Amazon doesn't reach these days. In fact, the more remote the spot, the more difference it's made to people's lives. Online retailing really opens up the world to us. You can't buy a rowing machine in John O'Groats, but Fred Fermos arrived the day after he ordered it on Amazon. Although we live in quite a remote area, we still have the same choice as someone walking down the uh, walking down Oxford Street in London. Across town at the hotel, the darts team shirts also came from Amazon, ordered by the manager, Andrew Mowat. See, look at that bullseye. Before companies like Amazon or even Internet, uh, it was a lot more difficult for us to, um, to get things here. We maybe do a 20-mile trip to Wicker Thurzo, or even worse than that, a 120-mile trip to Inverness. John O'Groats has one shop. The locals still use it, but it's never going to have all the things they can find when they're back home looking online. What's a chap to do if he needs a fancy dress costume? Oh, yes. Or even a special kind of mop for the family ferry business. The convenience is irresistible. Then at the click of a button, you can buy it, and basically it's here the next day. You don't have to live in John O'Groats to feel the lure of Amazon. We asked teacher Melanie Collins to run an experiment with her London class. Year six, I'm going to write a word on the board and I want you to think about the first thing that pops into your head, what does this word mean? 20 years ago, there was just one answer. I'm going to show you two pictures up on the board and you're going to put your counters underneath what you thought of first. OK, Mustafa, can you please come up and count how many people thought of the river? Eight. Eight people. OK, thank you. The mighty river never really stood a chance. Fourteen people. OK, have a seat, please. Most businesses would happily give their annual profits for that level of customer awareness. Amazon's ability to get into our heads is the product of a unique company culture. Its engineers in London are working on its growing film and TV service. Let's go through that really quickly. It's got a bit of information about each of the actors, um, some of the other movies that they're in. Hey, guys. Hey. Hi. How you doing? The British business is run by Christopher North, an American who moved here ten years ago. Everyone's kept in tune with the ideas of founder Jeff Bezos through a kind of Amazon think they're all expected to sign up to. We have 14 leadership principles at Amazon, and these are a set of principles that describe to us 
the characteristics you need to exhibit to be a successful Amazonian. Yeah. Have an extra Why? Was that because there was an and I think we found that they are a kind of glue that knits us together as a company, even now today that we're 97,000 employees at Amazon. The principles are on the website for anyone to see, and if you work at Amazon, you'll never forget them. It would be the equivalent of, you know, how the, 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 the Ten Commandments influence Christianity. They're not just words. I mean, you, you, you have to be able to embody these things on a day-in and day-out basis. Otherwise, you, won't, you just won't survive at Amazon. Staff don't have to learn the leadership principles by heart, but there's one idea that's drummed into them every day. Although leaders pay attention to competitors, they obsess over customers. Customer obsession is the single most important thing to Amazon Economics, it's the thing we focused on from the very beginning. Amazon executives, and, and Jeff Bezos in particular, will tell you in, until you, uh, you know, cannot stand hearing it any longer that they start with the customer and work backwards. Start with the customer and work backwards. I don't think you should make any bones about it. There's no, no socially wonderful thing about working from the customer backwards. It's smart business. You only have to visit your local Royal Mail sorting office to see the impact of online retail. Email has meant we're sending fewer letters, but that's more than made up for by all the extra parcel deliveries. Last year, Amazon alone sold an average of more than 70 pounds worth of goods to every man, woman and child in Britain. That's more than half of all online retail sales. Amazon account for a large amount of our traffic the difference in volume is, is ginormous. Yeah, massive contributor to the amount of traffic we pick up now. Amazon's business is good news for some, but bad for others. But we're a little low on stock at the moment. Across Britain, bookshops have been closing at the rate of more than one a week. <laughs> See you soon. I'll give you a call later, Mrs. Carrington. OK, bye-bye. In Banstead, Surrey, Linda Jones is ready to name the culprit. I've actually had people coming in and taking photos of books on their phones and looking and saying, you know, they'll look at the back and they will be there for some time and then they will leave and I know exactly what they're doing. They are going to Amazon to order that book because they can get it a lot cheaper. Linda says Amazon's prices can make trading impossible for her. For instance, David Walliams' new book, Demon Dentist, on Amazon, £5. We have to retail it at £10.99, £12.99. We can't buy it for £5. So How much does it cost you to buy? It costs us to buy £8.99. Amazon admits it sells some books at a loss. I think you'd find across, across many retail businesses it's very common for best-selling products to be sold at very low margin or even sometimes at a loss but ultimately we have to figure out how to make it all work. Linda needs to take £10,000 a month just to break even. That hasn't been happening, and for the past year she's been using her own savings to keep the shop open. I'll make you walk up with it. I love books and I love bookshops, and it's all well and good having that passion. Thank you. But I just can't afford to keep putting money into the business. For Amazon's founder, bookshops are just on the wrong side of history. Complaining is not a strategy. Amazon is not happening to book selling. The future is happening to book selling. Amazon didn't invent the idea of shopping from home. Mail order catalogues had offered it for decades. But this kind of thing started to feel distinctly low tech when a new vision appeared in the 1990s. Imagine a world where every word ever written Every picture ever painted and every film ever shot could be viewed instantly in your home via an information superhighway. Ordinary domestic phone lines offered access to an exciting future. It all comes down to computers communicating. And in fact, that's already happening on something called the Internet.
in 1994, there was this idea that maybe the internet's gonna be powerful enough that you can use it to create a kind of intermediary between customers uh, shoppers and manufacturers. Well, that was a very vague idea, uh, but Jeff had this notion that maybe if you focused it in one product category, on the internet you can offer everything. The question was, what's the first best product to sell online? I made a list of 20 different products and sort of force ranked them according to several different criteria and ultimately picked books. Bezos was already married to Mackenzie Tuttle, who he'd met at work but their domestic routine was about to be disrupted. He wanted to break away from the investment firm, roll up his sleeves and build a business. The Bezoses packed up their apartment and left New York behind. He was in such a hurry that he hired a removal truck. He told them to drive west and that he would get started and call them in a couple of days and tell them where exactly on the west coast they should go. Once, young men were told to go west in search of gold or land. But in the 90s, they went west in search of geeks. Bill Gates' Microsoft dominated the new world of personal computers from his hometown of Seattle, Washington. So there was plenty of tech talent around, and Bezos sent the removal truck there. Also heading to Seattle from California was an experienced programmer, Shell Caffin. Amazon's first employee. First we had to buy some computers and software. We couldn't afford very big computers or very many computers, or we did have to be frugal because there was a, not a huge amount of investment. The garage at Jeff and Mackenzie's rented house became the office. Bezos insisted on getting desks made from doors to save money. It's become part of Amazon mythology, the original example of another of those leadership principles, frugality. We try not to spend money on things that don't matter to customers. But employee number one always had his doubts about the desk doors. If you ask the people building them, you'll learn that they were actually more expensive than just buying a cheap desk. It looks frugal, but it isn't really frugal. I think frugality is in some ways a much misunderstood leadership principle. Frugality doesn't mean cheapness. It doesn't mean penny pinching. It means making efficient use of scarce resources. And I think within the door desk idea, the idea that you would improvise a desk out of the materials at hand, you also have the idea of a kind of, of a scrappiness, of a kind of making do with what you have to hand. After months of coding on the doors, Bezos's new business was launched. www.amazon.com it takes you to our website. Amazon's eighth employee, Todd Nelson, had been working as a waiter before he got the job that changed his life. They had actually started shipping books in Jeff's garage, and then they moved to this small warehouse. Todd started working here, ordering and dispatching books. He and his colleagues responded to a computer linked to Amazon's website. They had a bell that whenever a customer would order a book, there'd be a little ding, ding, you know, and everyone would cheer. So we made another sale. And within th the first few days, it was ding, 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 and they had to turn it off because, you know, it was annoying. <laughs> By listing any book that could be ordered from distributors, Bezos's small business would claim the title Earth's Biggest Bookstore. Over some large number of years, I think internet book selling is going to become a very large business. At the end of each day, work in Amazon's offices stopped, and everyone, including Jeff and Mackenzie, went down to the basement to help get all the orders into the last post. There's this feeling you just couldn't do enough. I was working, you know, 12, 16-hour days, working most weekends. I didn't take a vacation for the first two, three years but it's what I wanted to do. I mean, I was excited by my work. It's the most fulfilling work I've ever done. That first tiny basement warehouse in Seattle is a world away from what Amazon now calls its fulfillment centers. With more than 100 million items for sale on the website, keeping tabs on them across the network of warehouses is so complex that only the central computer really knows where things are. Amazon has such faith in it that any item can be stowed on any shelf. The product is stored completely randomly around the building, uh, and so the stower uh, is allowed to pick any location that they want to in order to put that product away. 
the random arrangement is actually efficient because it reduces the chance of a worker picking the wrong item, which might happen if similar items were stored side by side. A customer will come onto the website, order the product, and the computer system will decide the best fulfillment centre in which to, to pick that product. And uh, we have pickers, uh, and the computer system will send to their handheld scanner that order that says, go pick Downton Abbey Series 2, and it will also tell them where that product is. The ordering process is almost completely automated, but only a human being can walk down an aisle and tell the difference between an icing bag and a cuddly toy. They will scan the product and then the computer system knows that that product has moved from the shelf into the tent. Because the computer knows how big things are, it even tells the packers what size box to use for each item. Then, only at the final stage, the item is matched up with the customer's name and address. It goes onto our outbound dock uh, and it will get put onto one of our many uh, carrier's vehicles for onward delivery. Back in John O'Groats, there's a new van load of online purchases. Sandy, your costume's here. Perfect. Fred Fermer runs the ferry to Orkney. Out of season, there's time to get things ship shape. Here's that the order. Okay, thanks, Fred. And Andrew Mowat knows it's always easier to get the party started with a Captain America costume. Bezos was picky about who joined Amazon. He originally interviewed everyone personally. James Marcus passed the test. He didn't overwhelm you in a sort of show-busy, uh, titan of business way, but he had a lot of brain power and a lot of focus. And, you know, after 10 or 15 minutes of talking to the guy, a certain kind of magnetism came into play, which was not traditional and was that much more persuasive, I think, because of it. Amazon was soon too big for everyone to meet Bezos, but new recruits were fired up in sessions about him and the company history. Even in the initial training, you know, talk about things that Jeff would like and things that Jeff wouldn't like. You learn his story, driving out in the sedan, being in the garage and like founding the company. People love a winner. And so just being uh, on that team felt like something. It was, a, it was the kind of job you could tell your uh, future wife's relatives about and they would be impressed. At Christmas, the office staff were expected to help pack books at the warehouse. It gave them a rare insight into those much-discussed customers. You would pick the weirdest things. There was a lot of porn, there was a lot of scientific literature, and I would gift wrap once a copy of Mein Kampf. Of course I was hoping that whoever was sending it to someone for a Christmas gift was sending it as a kind of cautionary tale about man's inhumanity to man or see how far we can fall. But uh, sadly, the card that went inside the thing simply said, Merry Christmas. <laughs> By the late 90s, San Francisco was buzzing with dot-com startups reinventing business and office life. This is Nochka, because an old timer here. Been here since um. May. <laughs> Companies like Pets.com were famous for spending their investors' money with no sign of profits. Amazon, too, was losing hundreds of millions while moving to ever bigger offices. But in the dot-com boom, new rules applied. Wall Street gave companies a pass. They said, OK, we don't care if you make money yet. You're going to someday. But for now, just grow. Take that money, reinvest it in servers and marketing, whatever. Just grow until, you know, you hit the sky. And, and we'll be there as loyal investors behind you. Bezos and his staff think about Amazon's growth as what they call the flywheel effect. It works like this. If a customer's pleased with their Amazon purchase, they buy more. 
and tell their friends. So Amazon gets more traffic. That means it can offer more products at lower prices, which in turn attracts more customers. The flywheel builds momentum and becomes unstoppable. It seemed at that point like there was nothing Amazon couldn't conquer. In 1997, Amazon floated on a rising stock market only two years after it had opened for business. It was heady days for the internet, and the stock price did nothing but go up, up, up. Amazon's hard-working staff had all been given stock options when they joined. One of the greatest absurdities at Amazon was that the reason everyone was killing themselves was because of the possibility that they would become hideously, unspeakably rich. At the same time, no one ever talked about this. You know, it was very gauche to talk about it. Everyone had to, like, pretend as though it was some sort of communist state, that everyone was just working because they just love working crazy, crazy hard. But the reality, of course, underlying everything, is that there was this hope of some sort of enormous payoff. And for a while, it looked like that dream had come true. Did you read the Times this morning? Yeah, I saw the Times this morning. At one point on Friday, Amazon.com's total stock market value surged past $30 billion, making it worth more than a major industrial company like Texaco. According to my calculations, you yourself are worth somewhere in the vicinity of 9 or $10 billion today. I only say that because I've got a follow-up question. Okay. What's with the Honda? This is a perfectly good car. <laughs> the image of Jeff is one of sort of a brilliant strategic financial mind and a delighted child, you know? Um, and that laugh. I mean, really. <laughs> really. Jeff's laugh is, is memorable. You know, when you talk to him, uh, if you're in a meeting with him, it's, it's the thing that you emerge talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> I loved the challenge of it when I was there, especially at the beginning. And, and I, frankly, I loved Jeff, too. <laughs> but working down the hallway from his laugh after a while, it can, you know, get to grade on one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. In 1997, the internet was still a novelty for British business. Bothams have set up what's called a website. No, no, I can't. I'm... Back then, the new technology was much hyped, but didn't always deliver. The web promised universal access to information, but then in the early days it involved unplugging the telephone to use your dial-up modem and then have to wait many, many minutes before every page loaded. But it was still pretty exciting. Most big retailers didn't even have a website, but there were already other online booksellers competing with Amazon. Simon Murdoch was running a British site called Book Pages when he got a call from Seattle. Jeff Bezos got in touch and arranged to come to London. I think he talked to several businesses. Uh, he met us in a hotel in central London. Bezos said his staff in Seattle were already working on a UK version of Amazon, but Murdoch's book business created another possibility. The first discussions were coming here anyway. Would you like to be part of it or would you like us to compete with you? Quite aggressive. Yes. A deal was done for Amazon to buy Murdoch's business and for Murdoch to become head of Amazon's UK operation. Amazon.co.uk is going to revolutionise book selling because we're making a very large number of books available to people very easily. Initially people were pretty nervous about online shopping, I think. The idea of putting your credit card details into a little box on screen was worrying. Amazon.com, this is Dion. How can I help you? At first, Amazon set up call centers to take down the credit card details of timid customers, but most soon got used to the online routine. Amazon helped encourage people to trust the actual process of just buying something online. Satisfied customers were persuaded to move from books to toys, CDs, videos and more as Amazon expanded its range. We're trying to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything with a capital A that they might want to buy online. But anything. Anything. 
Amazon was becoming a giant retailer, but Bezos decided it could be a marketplace at the same time. That would be a way to spin Amazon's flywheel even faster. Bezos would get more value from both Amazon's website and its warehouses by offering outsiders the chance to sell their products on the website and use the warehouses to store and dispatch them. It's called Amazon Marketplace. The fundamental innovation was inviting third-party sellers uh, not only onto our site, but to actually compete with us directly on the very detail page. That's been so successful that today more than 40% of all the units sold on Amazon Worldwide are sold by third-party sellers. And that's creating jobs, even in this Nottinghamshire village. It's possible to make a living simply by spotting bargains in supermarkets to sell on Amazon as Mark Reedman and Keith Whittle have discovered. So we've got a couple of dolls. We've not sold dolls before. How much was that then? Four ninety nine. What do you reckon you can sell it for? They were selling for 17. 17. Whoa. Yes, you really can comb your local shops to find cheap stock to sell on Amazon Marketplace, if you know what you're looking for. Boots or Sainsbury's or Tesco's or Argos. Um, there are certain times of the year where they will do deals. It sounds easy, but like Amazon itself, this is a tech business. They track prices using software. In August, they bought a load of Star Wars Mr. Potato Heads and have been watching their price ever since. It sort of dropped down at the beginning of the summer, but as soon as we hit the November Christmas period, it's starting to rise and will probably continue to rise. It's a bit like trading on the stock market. Mark and Keith store their goods until it's the right moment to sell. Sometimes it means we have to sit on stock for six months, so we're investing our capital, but with a longer-term aim that we'll make a profit on that. Sometimes it's a bit of a lottery, but it normally pays off. If you've got the space to keep hundreds of games, gadgets and toys, Keith and Mark say you can earn your keep like this. If you're looking at between five to seven pounds a unit profit, then you've only got to be turning over, say, 15, 20 units in a day, and over a week, over a month, over a year, that adds up to be quite a decent salary. That's about a hundred pounds profit a day, or about 37,000 pounds a year, as long as you're open for business seven days a week. We've been labelled as a nation of shopkeepers, um, but actually, Amazon's sort of taken that for us as small retailers into the 21st century, where we can actually all sell our goods and our wares, but, you know, without the need of that physical premises. The internet has been the most hyped industry of the century, but now, as shares collapse, it could wreck the future for us all. The stock market couldn't rise forever. At the start of the new century, nervous investors started to panic. Well, all good parties come to an end. And so, bang, stocks would go from 50 to 5 in a month. And that was the end. Amazon staff, who'd watched with amazement as the stock price rose, now saw it lose 98% of its value. I lost millions of dollars of paper worth, and um, that's the way it goes. <laughs> you know, there, there's just no way around that. Only the very earliest joiners had enough share options to enjoy the rewards that everyone had been hoping for. Was it that you actually didn't need to work again? Yes. Yeah. I, I retired when I was 37. For less fortunate staff, there was a harsh new reality. Amazon.com, this is Lance. Instead of hiring, for the first time, Bezos was forced to lay people off. And he had to persuade those that remained that whatever Wall Street said, Amazon would continue to grow and would one day make money. 
top executives from that time say frankly that there was nobody inside Amazon who believed that this would one day be a 50 billion, let alone a 100 billion revenue company. But they also say that Jeff never blinked once, that, that he has ice water running through his veins, and that he saw that internet shopping is convenient and prices can be lower when you centralize inventory, and he just refused to blink. Alongside the customer-centric mantra, there's a toughness in Amazon's corporate culture. Leaders do not compromise for the sake of social cohesion. And leaders do not believe that their or their team's body odor smells of perfume. Hmm, curious. He really is a tough boss. He has driven that company and drives those people very, very hard and you either survive there because you buy into that culture and it's a culture that he has created, or you leave because it's just nothing you have any desire to be around. Dave Cotter left Amazon after four years to set up his own business. It's a social network for families, beginning with his own. Amazon can be a very difficult place to work, but I actually look back super, super fondly and kind of revere the intellectual challenge that it provided. It still can be really hard on a day in and day out basis to have kind of everything that you do or everything that you're surrounded by kind of be open, open for attack. Nadia Shurabura also left Amazon to launch a startup, bringing online technology to shops. It could hardly be more intense than her old job. Amazon was really the way of my life. I lived at Amazon and I lived within Amazon. Uh, I was married at Amazon and uh, every hour of my waking day I was thinking about Amazon. Here's one kind of crisis that all Amazon executives dread. Bezos gets a customer complaint. He forwards it to the person responsible with a single cryptic addition. You get an email message and there is just a question mark in it. I got one. For me at the time, it was just kind of scary and terrifying only because I hadn't been at Amazon very long. So immediate things, sweaty palms, uh, panic, anxiety, gets just drop everything, all hands on deck. We got to address this. What Jeff wants you to do is to go down and not only fix it, but fix it forever. Have a mechanism in place that that screw up never ever happens again. Many companies might just say like, okay, this one customer had this one issue. Jeff takes a very different perspective, which is maybe there's a way to improve the system. However long it takes, you work away until that particular failure is impossible. And then? And then you report back. And uh, you get a usually a smiley face after that, saying that, yes, thank you. Amazon survived the dot-com crash, just, thanks to having borrowed enough millions to stay afloat. But Bezos always had ambitions way beyond mere survival. The big ideas in business are often very obvious, but it's very hard to maintain a firm grasp of the obvious at all times. In the mid-2000s, Bezos set the company on a new path, using its existing assets to move beyond retail. Just as it had offered warehouse space to outside sellers, Amazon created a huge new business called Amazon Web Services, which rents out its computing power to outsiders. The company also drew on its techie expertise to create an e-reader, Amazon's first consumer product. Selling it direct to its customers made the flywheel spin even faster. The e-reader was created in a secretive Amazon lab in Silicon Valley. Amazon's new direction was a response to the success of Apple's iTunes played through its iPod. Jeff had seen what happened with music. We were buying our iPods, they were very pretty, but then what we were really buying was the music that went on top of them, the software. And Jeff said, well, I'm not going to let that happen to books. Books is our core business. It's central to us. I'm going to get ahead of that. And that's why he introduced the Kindle. So we would begin to buy our books and now our movies and our other content on the Kindle. The first version of the Kindle was launched in 2007, looking a bit like the poor relation of an Apple product. But two years later, there was a new model that Bezos went out to sell. Very few technologies have a lifetime of 500 years. The physical book has had a great run. 
So that's uh, it? Death well, of the physical book? I think there will always be books. It's not death. But if you look over you know, some period of time, it makes sense for it to continue to evolve. So if you believe, as I do, that long-form reading is important, then a device like Kindle is important because it makes that easier. The Kindle doesn't only let Amazon sell books electronically. It's created a publishing business too, because anyone can use it to upload their own writing. It's really democratizing the ability to, to start and grow a business uh, as an author, as, uh, turning authors, in a sense, into entrepreneurs. This couple have done well from Amazon's new self-publishing business. Nick Spaulding worked as a press officer for the police, but he'd always wanted to be a writer. Three years ago, he gave himself a final chance. I set myself the challenge to see if I could write an entire book in one sitting. So I sat down on a Saturday morning and just started writing. I had no idea how long I'd go for, but I managed 30 hours and had 50,000 words plus written at the end of it. After a bit of editing, Nick's book was ready for the world. He uploaded it to Amazon for sale to Kindle owners. If you've got all your ducks in a row before you sit down to do it, it takes 10 minutes. You need to give your book a price. If you keep it cheap, you'll sell more and earn 35% of the sales price. At some higher prices, you'll get a generous 70% in royalties. Click Save and Publish, and that is the end of the process. Initially, I was a little bit sceptical, not that I doubted his writing ability, but as it was a new idea, I just wasn't sure how it was going to work. You sell one, you sell two, and it's a thrill. Somebody you've never met, somebody you'll never meet, has bought your book and is potentially reading it right now. He would spend a lot of time in the evening checking his sales figures on the laptop and I would be there sort of rolling my eyes um, as he got, oh, we sold another copy, I've sold another copy. Gemma had to change her tune when Nick followed up his first effort with a bawdy comic novel. Annika was a goddess, a blonde, perfect, golden-skinned creature of myth, or Sweden, as they apparently call it these days. It started to sell, and it started to sell more and more. Sean thought I'd be the perfect candidate, given that he knew I was horrifically single. And would... For it to go up to a thousand over the course of an afternoon was a head spinning, to be quite honest with you. That year, Nick sold 430,000 books on Amazon. And now he's sold the books to a traditional publisher, cashing in a second time. Um, yeah, it was a six-figure advance, which, which is a lot for a, for a first-time author. Nick resigned from the police to write full-time. He and Gemma have already made use of his new earnings. I love Amazon. They bought me a house. If you look at the bestseller list, typically you'll find nowadays that about one in five of our Kindle best-selling books are self-published books via the Kindle Direct Publishing platform. That's a worry for these publishers gathering in London to discuss the future of their business. Amazon are undoubtedly the most important player in the book world today, uh, whether e-books or print books. They really are the central platform around which the whole publishing industry is operating these days. There's no shortage of speakers to offer views on the future of the business, but none from Amazon itself. Amazon is notoriously secretive. We'd like to have Amazon speakers here. But the way they operate, uh, they tend to not want to do things as part of an industry conversation or as part of a dialogue, which I think is a shame. Despite the threat from self-publishing, whether they like it or not, for many of these publishers, Amazon remains their top sales channel. They're torn between gratitude and fear. The general feeling is that it is terrifying and wonderful in equal measure. There's no escaping the fact that Amazon is a dominant force and um, monopoly is never good for business and certainly never good for the consumer. They're not in business to support publishers. They're in business to make Amazon as successful as possible. Um, and some of the things that they do in that are, are contrary to the things that we would like. So you fight back. And that's what I'm doing with HarperCollins. And I think we're doing as a business very well. And, um, you know, bring it on. 
there's plenty of fighting talk to keep the spirits up. We are an industry that has survived hundreds of years. We are going to be here in hundreds of years. But Amazon and its founder, Jeff Bezos, are never far from people's minds. Publishers think about Jeff Bezos sort of like they might think about God, uh, as a kind of very distant, inaccessible figure who is all-powerful and all-knowing. God loves us. Yes, but uh, God is vengeful. Uh... The Amazon universe keeps on expanding. The new Kindles still download books. All right, let's rehearse, huh? They also play Amazon's new TV and film productions. Action! There's a new set-top box to watch them on TV. We packed in loads of entertainment. Or play Amazon games. And now, in some American cities, there are Amazon grocery deliveries from vans advertising Amazon productions. With Amazon Prime, you get something truly amazing. And there's Amazon Prime, a subscription service for free delivery, which cross-promotes other Amazon businesses. You'll get access to the Kindle Owners Lending Library, where Amazon Prime members can borrow best-selling books for free. The Corelli family in Seattle live the complete Amazon lifestyle. Nice. All right, thank okay. you. My parents always use for groceries and stuff, and sometimes if we're out of snacks for school, we ask, Mom, did you order Amazon? And she always, yep, it's on its way. They're fed, entertained, and provided with literature, toys, and almost anything they might want to buy, all by one company. Mom, who's this for? Everybody. With our hectic schedules and the kids with different activities, we always need things right away. Uh, you know, kind of on-demand shopping. It's just been really good service for us. The Corellis are living proof of the flywheel effect. Every Amazon service they use increases their use of the others. I, I have to say the Amazon Fresh, because I liked it so much, it made me want to use Amazon.com even more. And the family's media consumption centers on their membership of Amazon Prime. Oh. So you can watch movies if you're a Prime member, stream it to your devices. And also, if you have a Kindle, you get you can borrow books if you have a Prime membership. You don't have to pay. Do you have Kindles? We do. We have four. Well, there's different types of Kindles, like a basic Kindle, a Kindle Fire, which is basically like a mini iPad. For the Amazon generation, visiting shops is just a waste of time. It's a pain in the neck. You just go into a grocery store and you have to look for everything. Amazon, you just search it up with the press of a button. It's easier. Jeff Bezos isn't finished yet. Let me show you something. Oh, man. He recently revealed something on American TV that caught the imagination of the world. These are uh, effectively drones, but there's no reason that they can't be used as delivery vehicles. Take a look up here so I can show you how it works. All right. We're talking about delivery here. We're talking about delivery. So there's an item going into the vehicle. I know this looks like science fiction. It's not. Wow. Amazon isn't claiming its drones will be operating anytime soon, but its eye-catching video just happened to be released ahead of Amazon's peak pre-Christmas sales period. Of course, this is a completely impractical way of actually delivering products, but it meant that everyone was talking about Amazon, and so people would go to the Amazon website and then buy stuff. It's only 20 years since Amazon sold its first book. Today, the company is valued at $170 billion, with an empire that caters for more and more of its customers' needs. But some of its early staff think it's getting too powerful. They're going to own the book. They're going to own the information that goes in the book. They're going to own the shipping. They're, I mean, it's just they can't own it all, you know? So I have mixed feelings sometimes about Amazon. Sometimes I feel like surely there are consumer items that I should simply go downstairs and buy from the store around the corner and not do the easy thing, which is find the laundry bags on Amazon and hit one click. You know, th there's an element of, of, of guilt in there. Do you think you're turning us into lazy and perhaps slightly guilty consumers? 
No, I don't think so at all. I think that um, anything we can do to make consumers' lives easier, including in their, the, the, the shopping they need to do, is giving time and money back to consumers that they can spend doing something else. You can't actually have the company that Amazon is and have it care about what it's doing to the ecosystem because it's actually designed from the ground up to be a shark. Like it's designed to dissolve and destroy other businesses by like undercutting them. Whether because of how it works or because of its sheer scale, Amazon's increasingly on the radar of politicians and regulators, especially in France. For decades, French law has stopped books being discounted by more than 5%, and that applies to Amazon, too. The novelist Aurélie Filippetti has a second life, as France's Minister of Culture, with a particular passion for protecting the nation's bookshops. For us, it's the guarantee of the protection of what we call the bibliodiversity. Parce que le livre, c'est un écosystème qui est un écosystème fragile et on a besoin que chaque maillon de cet écosystème se porte bien pour que l'ensemble donne une littérature qui soit florissante. Government and opposition are united in believing the existing restriction on book discounting isn't enough to restrain Amazon. Je crois que Amazon est une menace croissante pour la biodiversité. Now a new law will also restrict Amazon's free postage and packing offers. But nobody in this Paris bookshop seemed to mind. Quand on réduit les prix, ça veut dire qu'on réduit les salaires, qu'on détruit des, des conditions de travail et qu'on exploite des gens. Donc, donc j'achète autant que je peux, j'évite d'acheter sur Internet. Si Amazon avait le monopole total, dans ce cas-là, on ne pourrait plus avoir de contact avec son libraire. The minister accuses Amazon of trying to eliminate competition in the book business. De mon point de vue, Amazon fait une stratégie de conquête du marché dans les différents pays où ils s'implantent. Et donc, en gros, ils font du dumping sur les prix. En France, ils font du dumping sur les frais de port. No, I, I certainly, I certainly wouldn't accept that charge. I don't think we're trying to eliminate the competition. I think that UK customers, if I focus on the UK, which I know best. Um, have access to a lot of different choices, and, and price is one dimension on which retailers compete. But books are only one industry which has complaints about Amazon. Mark Constantine's lush shops sell soap and other products the company invents and manufactures from its headquarters in Poole, Dorset. Here's um, typical honey, I wash the kids. Um, you can cut this, have whatever size you like. Made with English honey, beautiful smell. There are no Lush products on Amazon.co.uk because Lush decided it wanted to control all aspects of its retailing. What upset Constantine was what happened when customers tried to find them. When you type in Lush inside Amazon, you're then taken to products from a competitor, so similar products to our own, but they are not us. Constantine was so incensed, he took Amazon to court. They have traded off our name, they've then damaged our reputation, and then we lose business because the customer thinks that we are not providing the quality that they expect from us. Lush won its case. Amazon declined to comment, but says it intends to appeal. But Constantine has a bigger objection to Amazon, while Lush employs people in its British factories and high street shops and pays corporate tax to the British government, Amazon's UK operations pay a lower rate of corporate tax through an Amazon subsidiary based in Luxembourg. It's saying to society, here's a marketplace, but we're not going to make a contribution to you financially, um, unlike other marketplaces like the high street. We're going to reconfigure that, and this is our business model. So I think that that's a fundamental attack on society. The choice of having a single European headquarters has nothing to do with, with tax or anything else. It's simply the only way we could operate a business of this complexity and scale. For the choice to be in Luxembourg, tax was one consideration. The French are also concerned about Amazon's tax arrangements. En matière fiscale, Il serait très utile de pouvoir avoir une stratégie européenne 
face à, à Amazon. Un petit peu partout maintenant en Europe, euh, il y a une véritable euh, exaspération qui monte face aux stratégies de prédation de euh, cette très grande entreprise. What we said very consistently is that we pay all of the taxes we are obligated to pay everywhere in the world, and we will always do so. However people may feel in Europe, back in Seattle, Amazon's tax affairs hardly raise an eyebrow. In the United States, tax avoidance is generally applauded. You know, this is a country that happened to throw a whole bunch of tea into the Boston Harbor when the British wanted to tax them on something that they thought was unfair. And so it is not surprising at all to, I think, most people who follow Amazon that it is doing what it can to pay as little in taxes as possible, both in the U.S. and abroad. For a successful business, Amazon has one unusual feature. It doesn't actually make money. <laughs> well, we are a famously unprofitable company. Since its founding, Amazon's sales have grown spectacularly. But its profits have been minimal. Bezos says that's deliberate because he's still investing in new warehouses and new businesses. It's very hard to beat a non-profit business. Other companies have to make a profit or their investors will be angry. Um, Jeff has successfully made people want to support a company that doesn't need to make a profit. And that's an incredible business advantage. However well Amazon's persuaded the markets it doesn't need to make profits or governments that it doesn't owe more taxes, the company insists it's still a good corporate citizen. We've collected and remitted more than a billion pounds of VAT on behalf of the Exchequer. We've purchased many billions of pounds of products from UK suppliers. We spent over a billion pounds in the last five years just on the delivery companies who do the last mile delivery. Um, and we've created you know, many thousands of jobs. There are new jobs in this warehouse, which only exist because of Amazon. Awesome Books was started in a spare room in Reading just seven years ago by Mubin Ahmed and his brother. For us, it was really just getting the supply uh, and almost Amazon could take care of the marketing and everything that would attract the sales that we needed. They get books from libraries, charities, publishers, anyone who wants to get rid of large numbers. The company's software tells its staff whether each book is worth listing on Amazon, keeping to sell elsewhere, or can only be thrown away. Awesome processes 18 million books a year and sells around 5 million to individual buyers, with Amazon the dominant outlet. Ultimately, uh, we wouldn't exist without Amazon. And so our profits are their profits in a way, and it's only fair that we have that symbiotic relationship where as we grow, they grow. 200 new jobs have been created here. Mubin has adopted Amazon's customer-centric ideas. At the end of the day, the customer has dictated that online is more convenient uh, and the price points are better for them, and so the market has to adjust. adjustment has created losers as well as winners. Your friendly local shopkeeper may feel the efficiency of online retail comes with a high price in terms of our relationships. We will become more insular as a society. We will sit at home in our rooms and we will type in what we need. We won't talk to anybody. You know, we won't communicate. Our communities will become smaller and we won't see people. And I don't want that. Take care. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye, Jack. Bye. Linda decided she had to stop using her own money to support the business, and the bookshop has now closed. Is it in Amazon's interest that bookshops go out of business? No, I don't, no, I don't think so. I think that Amazon does best in an environment where there is a lot of thriving competition. We're a company that, that appreciates a competition, and uh, it challenges us to do even better. Can anything stop Amazon? Well, competition between online and the high street may be taking a new turn that could leave Amazon playing catch-up. It's to do with smartphones. 
At the moment, people go into shops and they can check prices on their app, check it on Amazon, find it cheaper and buy it. So try something on in the, sh in the shop, but then buy it through a competitor. And I think that retailers are waking up to this fact and trying to create better experiences in the store. In Silicon Valley, eBay believes we're about to witness a blurring of on and offline shopping. So if only now we'll go to the next one. It wants to partner with traditional retailers and has a whole demo area to show what's possible. So Lisa clicks on these shoes, loves them, looks at some of the photos, says, you know what, I'm going to get these. They're right down the street. So what's interesting... This idea is click and collect with a new personal touch. Fantastic. And she notices she can check in automatically when she gets to the store. Fantastic. So she places the order and she knows when she then walks into the store, the store assistant's going to say, hey, Lisa, welcome to the store. We've got your pair of shoes ready. We can do things with technology in the physical store to make people understand, find and discover and then purchase product in a far better way. Some of these ideas are already out there, such as giant touch screens to encourage customers to buy online even when they're out shopping. Think Minority Report, right? The movie. This is, this is the possibility, right, of sort of you take these vertical surfaces and turn them into engagement, right, where, where the consumers can actually interact. And according to eBay, Amazon's business model may not be as efficient as it looks today. Having your own fulfillment centers, um, and many of them, is one way to go. It, it's expensive, it makes you become, you know, uh, a physical logistics company. eBay's vision reminds us that old-fashioned shops weren't actually such a bad idea after all. Guess what? They have products sitting there. So why then build another warehouse that's all around those, yet another place for trucks to show up and drop product and that kind of thing. And instead, take the inventory that's already moved close to that consumer and get it to them right from that point. Anyone trying to challenge Amazon will find its business is protected by its massive investment in technology, especially as it expands into media and tech services. Today, it's taking on much fiercer competition than shops. In reality, Amazon is competing with Netflix and Facebook and Apple and Google. And, and those are the companies that have the ability to undermine what Amazon has built all over those years. I think the next 10 years are going to be fun to watch as all these little battles take place to see who's going to win. Whatever happens, Jeff and Mackenzie have done OK. He's now worth $27 billion, according to Forbes magazine. She's become a novelist. And he's bought a prestigious newspaper, The Washington Post. Test, four, three, two, one, ignition. Oh, and he started his own rocket company, Blue Origin, to bring space travel to the masses. Maybe one day, it'll deliver Amazon packages to the moon. At this moment in time, Boy, it looks like Amazon is hitting on every cylinder. But it is a moment in time, and I think it is entirely possible as we go two years, five years down the road, things will change. Amazon will be disrupted one day. And you worry about that? I don't worry about it because I know it's inevitable. Companies come and go. And the companies that are the shiniest and most important of any era, you wait a few decades and they're gone. And your job is to make sure that you delay that date. I'd, sir, I would love for it to be after I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> the Open University delves further into how businesses like Amazon continue to boom. To discover more, go to bbc.co.uk slash businessboomers and follow the links to the Open University, where you can also take part in an online survey. Next here on BBC Two Scotland, to mark our 50th birthday, Dara O'Brien hosts a special quiz all about two.